Good afternoon, everyone. That's it. I know, I know you're also eating, but good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see you. Um, I'm Melissa Harrison. I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Executive Communications at CTA. And our good friend David, who was supposed to be here today, couldn't make it. He is with us, though, um, via technology, which is a great addition. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, and welcome to the CTA Innovation House. We are thrilled to host today what is going to be a very great conversation led by Network On. Special thanks also to Mr. Davidson, the Assistant Secretary for Commerce for Communications and Information and the NTIA Administrator for joining us later. For those of you who may be new to CTA, we represent over 1,500 of the most innovative American companies and CTA owns and produces CES, the world's most influential innovation event. We lead, inspire, and influence the tech industry and tech policy governing American businesses. Thank you again for attending today, and let's get back to the main event. Ashley? Thank you so much, Melissa. Welcome, everyone, to today's Network on Briefing. We're so happy to have you. My name is Ashley Durkin Rixey. I'm a senior director with Len Echo Group, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Network On. I will be your host and moderator for this program. Unfortunately, David Grossman of CTA cannot be with us today, but he is with us in spirit, thanks to the magic of broadband networks. David and a host of others are joining us right now, live stream via Zoom, which is super exciting. So we're really excited to have an audience here in DC and across the country because this is a subject that impacts all of us. I'm going to kick it off by introducing to you Dr. Raul Katz, who is going to present some of his new research on how broadband investment has impacted the economy from 2010 to 2020. If you have any questions for Raul, we'll be taking those later after our panel, where he will be joining us. So without further ado, Dr. Raul Katz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hi. Um, so uh, w when I was asked to, to do some research, the question was precisely where would we be had broadband not evolved the way it did since 2010? And when I started thinking about it, that reminded me of myself. And at risk of dating myself, I'm going to tell you a little story. When I was graduating, fresh of graduate school, I went to work for a major consulting firm, Booz Allen and Hamilton in, in New York. And uh, presumably, there should be an early adopter of technology. Uh, when I get there, I realize that there is a computer room, because none of us had computers at the time. And if I had to actually use a computer, I had to put in a sheet of paper the time at which I would be able to go. And if I was very late in writing that, I wouldn't have access to the computer for a whole day. I would have to wait until tomorrow. If I had to communicate with the foreign office of Booz Allen, I'd have to go to the um, telex room, where there was an operator that was actually key punching messages on the telex. And on weekends, when I had to work editing reports, I had to actually write them on paper and then drive to the pharmacy where there was a fax machine and fax the report from the pharmacy. And uh, so I, I was wondering, well, uh, things have changed and sometimes we tend to lose perspective as to how much they've changed and how our work and our productivity have changed as a function of broadband deployment. And that's the topic of my presentation. Uh, why starting in 2010? Well, basically, 2010 is somewhat of an inflection point. Obviously, we have the 2008 recession. But 2010, as you see, the average speed of broadband and the adoption started climbing dramatically. In 2010, 0.87% of households had what has been the standard for the FCC in terms of broadband. 25 megabits download, 3 megabits upload. 0.87% of households. And the average speed in America was 10 megabits. Now, if you fast forward to 2020, you see a situation where it dramatically increases to an average speed of 174 megabits per second, and we're roughly 66% of households. So clearly, we have almost like a quasi-experiment in the sense we have 10 years where we can actually model 
what has been the economic impact of this dramatic increase? And that was the purpose of our work. Now, when you do impact, and some of you know this, um, and if you like to relate uh, economic work, can you have the next slide, please? And you want to have the, 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 the uh, relationship between the uh, size of the economy and broadband penetration of households, what you see is that there is some, it's a correlation. Uh, now, you know, economists and statisticians say, well, is there a causality? Is broadband impacting the economy or are each of these dots is a state in the United States? Or are effectively states purchasing more broadband, population in those states purchasing more broadband just because they are richer, they're making more money. So which way these things work? And that was the crux of the work. Could we actually measure the impact that broadband we have on the economic growth? So we did four models. And uh, I'm not going to belabor the point that's somewhat um, described in, in, in the actual material. But basically, we started by looking at uh, what's called a long-run economic growth model. That's Bob Solo's approach that says, well, there's something that explains economic growth beyond just capital and labor. There, there could be some other factor. And we used that we tried to include there the diffusion of broadband in the first model. The second one was a spatial error model, which actually says, can we correct for the neighboring effect of broadband diffusion? Is actually, let's say, um, uh, Vermont benefiting from some development on broadband in some neighboring uh, uh, state, some sort of like a spillover effect? And can we correct for that? The third is actually getting really to the uh, direction of causality, what's called the instrumental variable models. And I'm not going to describe the, the, the stati statistical definition of that. But basically, you're trying to control for some of the effects of other variables on what you're trying to measure. And finally, we used a, a simultaneous equation model just to calibrate for the robustness. So contrary to research that has been done on this issue where researchers tend to look at one of the models, we really attack the problem from different perspectives, trying to see can we, for certain, estimate what the impact of broadband has been on the economy. And, and, and we actually prove the point on, on all four models. Well, in terms of the long-run economic growth, we actually came up with, next slide, please. A couple of things that are interesting. On, on one hand, that broadband penetration drives an increase on the GDP. But more importantly, that uh, the states that have higher speed of broadband have a higher economic effect. So not only there's penetration as a driver, there's also what economists call the um, return to speed. At faster speeds, the economy tends to be more efficient. We looked at spatial error, and we realized that there was no impact from neighboring states. We looked at instrumental variables, and we looked at the simultaneous equations. And what we actually saw, since this was done on, on, on the last four years, 2016 to 2020, that the effect was higher in terms of the coefficients. What that means is, in fact, again, a confirmation that faster broadband drives higher impact on the GDP. So we felt comfortable because we had attacked these from uh, different perspectives. Next page, please. So then we had to apply that to explain the growth of the economy. And I'm not going to be very in much detail, but basically what you have is you have a number of variables in each of the models, which we are trying to explain what is the how much of the growth in capital accumulation is explaining economic growth in America. And the contribution of labor, the contribution of trained workforce, that's the human capital uh, term. And then we have broadband and broadband speeds. For each of the models, we had a coefficient of impact. So, and some of them are better than others, and they're you know, advantages and disadvantages. So what we chose was to average all those and come up with the last column in terms of what would be the impact of capital accumulation on, on, on economic growth, so on and so forth. And based on that, we could apply it to what is called a growth accounting model. How can we explain the growth on the GDP? Next slide, please. And, and this is what the, the, the results are. Essentially, that capital accumulation explains quite a bit of the growth. And, and, and there's no surprise. I mean, between 2010 and 20 in the United States, the capital contribution has been definitely quite strong in terms of explaining economic growth in that uh, portion of history. Labor, too. But more importantly, in terms of the study that we're trying to do is fixed broadband and the increase in speed 
if you accumulate those two effects, it's quite sizable. So even if I tease out the impact of capital and labor on human capital, uh, in fact, broadband is, is quite an important driver on telling us where is the GDP today relative to where it was in 2010. So then we come up to the explanation of the results. And so next slide, please. And what we do is, in 2010, the GDP of the United States was $15 trillion. And these were, were broad, this is where broadband was at the time, in terms of penetration, speed, and the average speed. And so there we applied and said, well, we're in a fork in the road. Either we can keep broadband stable, because we're trying to quantify the, what broadband has brought to the picture in terms of the economic development. Either, either we keep broadband stable, or we actually move to where broadband is today. And where broadband is today is, we are at, at a penetration of 66%, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, the average speed 174 megabits per second. And what that drives in terms of the coefficients is where the GDP would have been had broadband stayed at this level, or where it is right now based on um, where broadband is. And the difference between both is actually the economic gain of broadband. And that's 6% of the GDP, so that's important because on a $20, billion, $20 trillion GDP, 6% being explained by broadband, is, it's quite significant in terms of what that has brought to the picture. In addition to the fact that I don't have to go to the pharmacy to fax my work, I just have to uh, rely on my one gigabit per second line at home. So clearly, there's something. Just to sum up, uh, 2010 is the beginning of the inflection point of this rate of growth on, uh, on the uh, uh, average speed and the penetration within the United States. In fact, that hasn't stopped. I mean, obviously, the growth rate at 61.7% has slowed down because, you know, the higher you grow in, in, in penetration, the, the, the rate of growth on an annual basis starts diminishing. But we are, we are quite a bit higher than that, particularly the pandemic, uh, in, in effect, contributed positively because people realized that either they had broadband to do teleworking and healthcare and telemedicine and, uh, and um, distance education, or they were out of the picture. So these numbers have kept on growing after 2010, in fact, 2020. In fact, we are now doing research, we completed research on the impact of the pandemic. So rather than stopping it in 2020 or the beginning of 2020, we're looking at what has happened between 2020 and 2021. But that's not part of these papers. So that's the inflection point in 2010. What this research has actually confirmed is actually the impact of penetration and the return to speed. And, and in numbers, 10% of growth in broadband penetration drives 0.09 growth in the GDP. And if you add the impact on, on speed, you get to 0.17. So pretty sizable effect. And, uh, and, and overall, we are in a, in, a, in a good situation. We have actually confirmed the, the assumption that we have started with. And, and the next uh, stage in our research is, as I said before, looking at what has happened since the start of the pandemic, both economically, but we are also looking at the impact on healthcare, and we're looking also at the impact on teleworking. So we're taking each of those areas and we're seeing what has happened. In fact, the results we have are quite interesting so far, indicating that um, the penetration of broadband increases the likelihood of vaccination. It's like it increases the likelihood of people taking care of their health, the level of health, so there are a number of positive effects that go well beyond the dollars and cents. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Katz. We're gonna take a five minute break and then we'll get our panel started. Thanks all. <laughs> so, before we get started with our panel, I want to tell you a little bit about what Network On is all about. And I'm going to personally contextualize this a little. I, like all of you, during the COVID-19 pandemic, ran my life off of the internet. And we all did everything. We worked, we got healthcare, we connected with our families. 
I attended a Zoom Seder for the first time in my life ever, which was very exciting. Uh, we had holidays over Zoom. I think we've all experienced sort of the internet really helping us kind of get through. And we had the confidence, thanks to some of the investment that Dr. Katz talked about in his papers, that our internet was going to hold. And it was going to adapt to all the things that we were throwing at it. And that is because we've taken the time to make that investment, to make sure our networks are resilient. And now the question is, what comes next? And so Network On is here to sort of celebrate those big wins, celebrate all the new delivery thing systems that we have coming out of this with telehealth, online skilling, remote workforce opportunities, and you'll be hearing about many of these at a further date. And also talk about what do we need for the future? How do we need to invest in our networks, get more access to broadband for more Americans, and really be ready for whatever the future may hold for us online? And I just want to thank our partners who have supported Network On, including the Consumer Technology Association, our host today, Comcast, Zoom, the Mike Coalition, and Patreon. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, we have a fantastic panel, and I'm going to introduce them. First up, Assistant Secretary Alan Davidson, who is also the administrator for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, better known as NTIA. Please have a seat. And joining us next will be Caroline Kitchens. Caroline is the lead for government affairs and policy partnerships at Shopify. And all the way from Louisiana, we have Vineeth Eingar, Louisiana State Executive Director for Broadband Development and Connectivity at Connect LA. And joining us for your questions at the end, and a few that I'm going to torture him with, it's Dr. Raul Katz, Director of Business Strategy Research at the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation at Columbia University and President of Telecom Advisors. All right. Thank you, panel. Uh, Assistant Secretary Davidson, I'm going to start with you, put you on the spot for a second. Excellent. Um, these charts we've been looking at, and in Dr. Katz's fantastic presentation and paper, shows that broadband network investment has a significant impact on economic growth. But we all know that those opportunities are not realized if broadband isn't available in your area. Can you tell us a little bit about what you hope to see happening economically over time, what you'll be doing with some of the bead funding for broadband networks, and what's your vision for how the internet can revitalize certain areas of our country? Uh, great set of questions. First of all, uh, good to be here. Thank you for, uh, thank you for hosting us. Uh, glad to uh, be invited to be here and talk about you know, this kind of, uh, it's a, uh, it is a historic moment. Uh, right now in our country as we think about addressing these long-standing inequities. And, you know, it starts for us with the fact that we've been talking about the digital divide in this country for over 20 years, uh, probably significantly longer. Thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, the investments that uh, Congress has made uh, and that President Biden has made a priority, we finally have the resources to do something really serious about it, to really make progress against connecting everybody in America with high-speed, reliable, affordable internet service. That is a huge mission, and that's the mission that NTIA and our sister agencies are taking on. Uh, and I'll say it's also about more than just that connection, right? That we know that uh, a connection of infrastructure alone does not bring prosperity. Having a, cable, a wire or a, a connection that's available in your household doesn't help a family if they can't afford it. It doesn't help them if they don't have the devices to get online. It doesn't help them if they don't have the tools they need to be able to participate in the digital economy. So we are really looking at this holistically and thinking about how do we make sure that we're pursuing meaningful adoption, 
real meaningful use for families um, and working, working people out there so that they can participate in this economy. I will say I was struck uh, in the paper by this, uh, by this, this finding that uh, if we had had you know, the same levels of adoption that we had in 2000, since two, in 2010, if it was stable, right, that we would have had a $1.3 trillion, uh, I think was the number, I'll leave it to the, you know, uh, $4,000 per person, that is in, in GDP loss. That's pretty staggering, right? And I think it just underscores the stakes here, right? And that if we can, and this is our, the vision, the, the, the modest vision, connecting everybody, giving them the tools to succeed online, it's quite obvious there's a real opportunity for them to participate, uh, to address in the digital economy. Um, there's gonna be economic opportunity for individuals, for families. There'll be a chance to address some of the inequities that we've long had in our society. And there's a chance to build up the competitiveness of our economy. And I think all of those things are what we're, you know, we're aiming for and hoping to achieve with these programs. Thank you. Caroline, I want to turn to you next because Shopify really exemplifies that one of the online tools to participate in the digital economy and the overall economy for millions of Americans, especially small business owners. Can you tell me a little bit about what Shopify does? We all hear it, but love to hear a little more about how the platform came about, the services you provide, and why that's so critical. Yeah, absolutely. And first, I want to say thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Dr. Katz, for your excellent research. Uh, so I'm Caroline Kitchens. I'm the lead for policy partnerships at Shopify. At Shopify, our mission is to make commerce better for everyone. Uh, so essentially, we provide software and tools that enable entrepreneurs and small business owners to remain independent and to compete with marketplaces and large businesses. Uh, basically, Shopify enables anyone to sell anything, anywhere. Uh, for basically as little as $5 a month, any non-tech savvy entrepreneur can purchase a subscription to Shopify. And within a matter of hours, they can set up and design their own custom online store that would be able to accept payments, manage inventory, all of those things. Um, and keep in mind that before tools like Shopify existed, an entrepreneur would probably have to pay someone thousands of dollars to set up and design a website for them or they would just be faced to join a consumer-facing marketplace, uh, like an Amazon or an eBay, where they might find customers, but they would not be able to have their own personal brand shine through, and they would be competing with a sea of other products that look similar to theirs. So essentially, Shopify seeks to remove barriers to entry in the e-commerce marketplace, and we also help entrepreneurs with all of the major pain points that they face along the way. Uh, so we handle payments, logistics, shipping, fulfillment, capital, more. There's really a growing suite of products designed to help entrepreneurs. Uh, and we now operate in more than 175 countries and power more than 850,000 businesses in the US alone. And I think something that I want everyone to keep in mind through all of this is that when an entrepreneur starts a business, it doesn't just affect that entrepreneur. It really causes a ripple effect that affects so many people. It might affect their family. It'll affect the community that they live in. It will affect any suppliers that they might use, any people they might employ, customers, and ultimately the entire world. So this is what we call the Shopify effect. Uh, worldwide, Shopify merchants create 3.6 million jobs, and they have an economic impact of more than $307 billion. Uh, and I think, obviously, it goes without saying that none of this is possible without broadband access. Thank you, Caroline. Beneath, you and I were talking earlier uh, a bit about the economic diversity of Louisiana and that there is everything from precision agriculture to arts and entertainment. There's a great level of higher education there. Can you tell me a bit about how you consider the economic needs of the state as you're distributing grants or thinking about grants you're applying for? No, that's a, that's a great question. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I also have to be careful what I say because the assistant secretary is going to approve our plans for broadband. <laughs> no. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully soon. No, but, uh, you know, look, we've had a great, we, we, we have a great relationship in, with your team at NTIA, assistant secretary, and uh, they've been great to work with. And so we, we continue that conversation. We'll continue to that working partnership. Um, look, Louisiana is really blessed with 
a tremendous number of diverse industries that all could benefit from broadband. We've got a really strong healthcare industry. We have a very strong tourism industry. We have a very active and strong startup environment. We have a strong uh, oil and gas industry. We have a strong uh, clean energy industry that's burgeoning. And so, and, and ag, and so on and so forth. What's interesting from our perspective is we spend a ton of time on the road in Louisiana. Geographically, we can cover one end to another within a couple of hours. But it, we are purposeful and intentional in the kinds of folks that we want to meet when we do meet with folks on the road. Why is this important? Because in Louisiana, almost a million and a half people do not have access to the internet, either because it's a device issue, access issue, literacy issue, and affordability issue. 47% of whom are, are African American and Latinos. And so it's a big problem. Louisiana has about four and a half, four point six million people. Many of those people that are a million and a half are either teacher, farmers, healthcare professionals, librarians, small business owners. And what's really important for us is we're gonna solve, um, and we're confident that with the resources that we will receive, that we will solve this digital divide in Louisiana by 2029. And we will work as much and as hard to do that because we have to work with the same level of urgency that people need us on a daily basis. But what really gets us excited then is, what are those use cases once broadband becomes either a platform, asset, or an enabler that helps to drive down operating expenses for a farmer, helps to improve revenue and profit for a small business owner that needs internet, um, that helps to drive telehealth adoption so we improve healthcare outcomes in a market like Louisiana from where we are, which is I think 49th or 50th, to let's say you know, 40th, if not higher over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And so, so those use cases really get us excited. Those use cases really help us drive forward with trying to understand where the challenges are throughout Louisiana, both rural, underserved, and community anchor institutions and to drive this money and resources where it needs to go as quickly and efficiently as possible. And so we will continue to percolate some of those challenges, understand those challenges, develop the use cases, and work with NTIA and all the folks in this room to drive uh, those solutions forward. I might just chime in really quickly on this, which is to say, uh, we have also really valued our working relationship with the state of Louisiana. and. Uh, uh, you can hear you know how much intention is going into their uh, their approach to this. And I'll say, you know, a lot of the money that NTIA will be giving out will go ultimate first through the states, right? States will be the ones who administer the grants. And um, there's there's virtue in that design by Congress, right? I mean, it means that because we know that the needs of Louisiana are very different than the needs of Montana or Rhode Island. And so states get to craft their plans. But the one thing I will say, and uh, as a shout out here, is that uh, we hope that states are going to act with the kind of intention uh, that Louisiana is acting, thinking about how to plan uh, uh, carefully for the different funding streams that they'll have, NT funding from NTIA, funding from other federal sources and state sources, uh, I think in the context of Louisiana, and also thinking with intention about what it is that people are going to do online, right? So a real shout out there, because I think the, um, the truth is people are, you know, get online for a reason. And we need to, they need to know what that reason is. They need to have, and, and there are going to be lots of things that drive people online. Maybe it's a telehealth application. Maybe it's because they need to get online for school. Maybe it's work. Maybe it's these new economic, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's Shopify, right? So, uh, and the business activity there. So um, uh, ultimately, those are going to be the drivers. And thinking with intention, like I say, at the state level about how we incentivize and make the internet a place where people can thrive in the digital economy. Uh, that's that's the key, and so uh, salute that work. Well, that's a great segue to my next question for you, Assistant Secretary. Um, I wanted to ask you about NTIA's Middle Mile program. This is another program that you have where you're leveraging regional and local networks to help make that connection. Can you tell us a little more about the program and why it's so important to help that sort of federal to local state relationship? 
We're, we're very excited about the Middle Mile program. So in addition to the uh, $42 billion state grant program that we're administering and the $3 billion uh, digital equity program, we have a billion dollar Middle Mile program. But the amazing thing about Middle Mile is that if we do it right, it can be a real force multiplier. Um, so this is you know building out that uh, it's kind of invisible middle infrastructure, visible to most consumers. But the hope is that uh, if we do this right, we're, we're helping build the, that backbone, uh, that, that interconnection, uh, that ultimately the last mile networks will be built on top of. And so if we can make those investments well and right, we're hoping it will aid in uh, making much more economical uh, last mile deployments, maybe aid in pr promoting competition. Uh, and uh, I think the, um, uh, the interesting thing also about Middle Mile is that it's probably gonna be the first money that goes out the door from NTIA, the first shovels that hit the ground. Uh, we've got fairly complex programs that we're administering. The timelines that Congress put forward, uh, it, it will take states some time to do the grant making that they ultimately do. But Middle Mile starts, in fact, I was going to say it starts today, but actually it started last week. We opened our, our, our uh, this is a grant program that NTIA is administering. Uh, the application window opened last week. Applications are due in September. Uh, we've already gotten dozens of them. Uh, we're expecting, honestly, hundreds of them. And uh, we're excited to see what applications come in and, and, like I say, how we can use it as a force multiplier out there. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn, let's turn to you for a couple questions about how broadband access and uh, speed and connectivity has impacted the growth of Shopify. I'm, Shopify began before the pandemic, but I am sure there was quite a change after the pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit about how that's impacted growth for both the platform and your customers? Yeah, absolutely. I think first, um, Shopify wouldn't really exist as we know it without broadband access. It's really just not possible. Uh, we're working really hard to provide all the tools and to reduce all the barriers to entry and to help entrepre entrepreneurs, but we need broadband access. It can't be done without it. Um, and I think in a sense, we are lucky that the pandemic happened at a time when it did, uh, both because the in internet infrastructure could withstand such a massive shift online and because tools like Shopify existed. Uh, but um, imagine how many, how much better it could have been with better broadband access. So um, Shopify obviously exploded during the pandemic when a lot of brick and mortar stores tried to move online or people just needed to find other streams of income. Um, and we've really seen firsthand how broadband access promotes on entrepreneurship. I'd be happy to get into some examples from across merchants. I don't know if you want to save that for later. But no, let's tease us a little. Give us one. <laughs> sure, <laughs> of course, happy to. Um, so yeah, we've really seen at Shopify firsthand that broadband access promotes entrepreneurship. And we know that when entrepreneurship flourishes, it creates more jobs, uh, it helps the economy, and it just improves the lives of everyone. So one example that we like to point to is a city called Wilson, North Carolina. Uh, Wilson is a small city in the eastern part of North Carolina. In the early 2000s, the economy was really struggling due to the loss of manufacturing jobs. About one-fourth of the, of the city's residents lived below the, the poverty line. Then in 2008, Wilson began building an extensive broadband network to give internet access to all residents. Uh, fast forward a decade, and Wilson's economy now supports all kinds of jobs. It was actually ranked as the 10th best small city in the US to start a business. And we've seen that the number of businesses in Wilson that are on Shopify actually increased by 86% from December 2019 to December 2020. Um, and we, we've seen similar examples across many individual Shopify merchants. We have one merchant called River Babe Threads, which sells women's apparel from a small town called uh, Rockford, Michigan, which has fewer than 6,000 residents. Better broadband access enabled them to do more marketing through social media, grow their sales, and they now have a staff of 12 people. Um, another example is a merchant called Barn Swallow Flowers, which is in Oskaloosa, Iowa. And the owners of Barn Swallow Flowers actually use an online point of sale system to sell flowers from very remote country fields. And none of that would have been possible without broadband access. Uh, so when the pandemic hit, Shopify really made it our mission to make sure that more small and middle-sized companies could make it through. Um, we actually received one support call from a farmer 
Uh, I think in May 2020, that was played during an internal staff conference call. And the, the merchant actually cried on the phone thanking Shopify. She said, I, didn't, I almost didn't start an online business because I thought it would be too difficult to set up a website. Uh, but Shopify's platform really enabled me to make it through and my business wouldn't be here without it. Uh, so yeah, again, that's just one example, but we've seen countless cases like that. And obviously none of this is possible without reliable high-speed internet connections. We're all gonna go home and Google Barn Swallow Flowers <laughs> right now. Uh, Vineeth and Jose, I think your microphone might have turned on, so check that while it turned off. There we go. Have a question for you. So it's not just individual entrepreneurs, it's also workforce development really is enabled and assisted through broadband access. And I know some of the grant programs that you administer, there are, pro there's, as for partnerships with local technical schools and colleges, can you tell me a little bit more about how you think about how can we bolster the workforce in general? Yeah, so that's a great question. So very early on, um, late, actually in Q3, Q4 of last year, we started bringing together the ISPs to really understand from an execution perspective, what would prevent them from um, deploying fast networks. Obviously, labor, right? During normal times, labor is an issue. Pandemic labor is an issue. Coming out of the pandemic um, you know, it's, a, it's an issue. Ongoing is an issue. So one of the things that we quickly recognized was that a huge competitive advantage that we have as a state is the fact that our community college system is really robust in terms of its course offerings, but in terms of how they engage industry. And so we reached out to the CEO and, uh, and the president of the community college system in Louisiana. We reached out to a number of the chancellors in Louisiana. And what we did was we strongly encouraged all of the providers that were gonna apply for our grants and then future grants to partner and help develop workforce plans and start engaging in that process. Why is that important? Because A, we wanna get ahead of the curve. Frankly, secondarily, it's also because a lot of these networks are gonna be built locally in all of the parishes. So we have 64 parishes in Louisiana. So if you start to think about, um, and to, your, to your analysis, the job growth that's gonna occur on a per parish basis because of this singular investment and the number of folks that could be employed in each of these parishes, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of folks on a per parish basis. So we encourage that behavior the ISP stepped up, they partnered with uh, the community colleges, and um, you know, we're thrilled now that it's now embedded in the notice of funding opportunities that we pushed out on May 13th, where um, it is strongly encouraged, and I think it's a requirement, that it is, it is a requirement, there we go, um, that now we continue to partner with community colleges to addressing the workforce issues, because it's gonna drive both construction jobs, maintenance, operations, and that's really important as we start to include aspects of digital equity and inclusion, right? Folks that typically would not benefit from these jobs, we now have a golden opportunity to include them to be part of the formal uh, workforce to help make uh, a success all these networks and investments that we're going to make. And Assistant Secretary Davidson, how does NTIA consider some of these things, workforce development sort of on a holistic level in the work that you do? Uh, well, it's just, it's just as Vinay said, the workforce is a, is, a, is a challenge and a huge opportunity for us. Uh, from the beginning, I think the, the, this infrastructure effort has been, it's, it's both a connection opportunity, but it's also a job growth opportunity, right? There are going to be tens of thousands of new jobs uh, that are going to be created in this project of spending billions of dollars to build out new networks and connect millions of households that haven't been connected. It's a challenge because we are going to, you know, need, need to fill those jobs and there are going to be shortfalls and we've heard that. Uh, and when we went out and talked as well to ISPs and to local communities, we heard this concern about, um, about the question of who will fill these jobs and will they be, uh, will those jobs be filled by the people in the communities that are being served by these networks. That is our hope. And that is the opportunity. It's just the opportunity that Beneath was talking about, which is to make sure that we're bringing in the local community, 
getting people engaged in building the networks that are going to serve their community. It's a huge it's a huge opportunity um, to bring in communities that haven't necessarily been partaking in these job opportunities before. So uh, communities of color, making sure that women are engaged in these. Secretary Raimundo, Secretary of Commerce, is extremely <laughs> emphatic about the fact that we need to make sure that we're bringing in uh, a, diverse, a diverse workforce. And um, one of the things that we've done is really tried to make sure that's front and center in the projects that we're, in the funding that we're putting out. Just as Vineet said, uh, it is a requirement now for states when they present their plans to us to get their state grant funding, they've got to have a workforce plan as part of it. They have to show how they're going to engage the local communities. They have to show how they're going to build a local workforce. We're also really excited about uh, the Digital Equity Act and the opportunities that it offers. There's going to be funding uh, for states and for communities in the Digital Equity Act uh, for a variety of, uh, of efforts to try to bring in different communities, but particularly uh, job training, upskilling, uh, workforce development could be a key part of that. So we're trying to braid together these programs, use all of the resources at our disposal to make sure that we're taking advantage of this and making it a workforce opportunity. Yeah, I just like to comment on some of the things that I've heard, uh, on, on particularly on, on the issue of jobs. I remember doing, you might not remember, when the um, Recovery Act by at the beginning of the Obama administration was enacted, there were only $8 billion that were designated for broadband. And at the time, we made a calculation that that would generate roughly, we call this a construction effect, 120,000 jobs. Now, use this to calculate how many jobs are going to be required in the current uh, unemployment situation or full employment that we're facing right now. So this is a big challenge, but I think it's good from a, from a job creation benefit. The other thing that I found it fascinating on all the uh, interventions is the notion as a, look, in, in broadband, when we discuss policy in broadband, we have either coverage or deployment of networks, and then we have what do we do with the networks kind of thing. And, and, and many of the topics in the presentations of the panelists have to do with uh, well, okay, we, we fulfilled the first one, policy-wise. Now let's talk about the second one. For instance, in the Assistant Secretary mentioned the issue of how we're going to train people that have broadband to use it. We've done research at the micro data level indicating that if a household receives broadband, um, the people that are more educated are going to benefit more in terms of their income than the people that are less educated. That men will benefit more than women. Not that women are not going to be generated, but there's an inequality. So if we don't deploy the kind of initiatives that have to do with digital literacy, education, development, we, we might have that kind of a problem. So I'm glad to see that actually, from an economic perspective on the use case emphasis, or from uh, just training or the usage of devices, that's the next agenda. We're talking about the right things. It's like we have a complete or check on the first one, Let's move to the next one, which is a logical link. Well, that's a great segue to ask you a question, Caroline. You know, one of the things about Shopify is it simplified many of these services and made them accessible in a way that the digital literacy, the business literacy is sort of all taken care of. What do you hear from Shopify customers about just are, are they just amazed that it was this easy? Were they pulling their hair out beforehand? Yeah, and I can actually give a personal story uh, because as part of Shopify training, they require all new, all new employees to set up their own Shopify store online. Mm -hmm. um, I will admit that I struggled a little bit as a government affairs person and not someone who is super tech savvy. Uh, but honestly, within just a couple of hours, like I had a basic storefront available, it could have made sales. Uh, so I think we want to make it even easier so that even your grandma could go online and set up a store. It's never going to be super seamless, um, but our goal is to make it as easy as possible and to obviously have a robust support system as well if you need help. Uh, so I, I can attest that it is pretty simple and it's our goal to always remove more barriers to entry and always make it easier. Uh, so I think just last week we launched our Shopify Lite subscription, which is as little as $5 a month. Before that, it was $29 a month. Uh, but $5 a month plus a 14-day free trial, we want to make it as easy as possible for anyone to be an entrepreneur, anyone to join the e-commerce marketplace and make their lives better for their family, their community, and the world. 
Oh, that is a great story. Um, have some questions here from those of us who are joining us live online that I want to ask you. Um, if we meet here again in five to 10 years, what do you hope has changed for broadband access in the United States? So we talked about sort of the last 10 years, so let's think ahead. If we came back, what would you like to see happening or has happened? You're looking at me, so I don't know. <laughs> Down the line. <laughs> well, well, if it's 10 years, uh, the goal, well, within 10 years, is to solve the digital divide in Louisiana. I mean, full stop. That's the vision that we have. It's the vision that the governor set in 2019. So he likes to remind me, just like everyone else, that, hey, we're, we've got seven years left. So again, our, our goal within the next seven years is to, uh, is to stamp out, remove this digital divide that exists in Louisiana. I will say our, our mission is very similar with the scope uh, looking across the country, which is to make sure that everybody in America has high-speed, affordable, reliable internet access. Um, and I'll just say, you know, I think when I when I look take out that longer view, I think we should if we if we look back, you know, generations before us, you know, brought water and electricity to rural America. They built the interstate highway system. This is our generation's infrastructure moment. And my hope is that when we look back 10 years from now, maybe 20 years from now, but I think not too long in the future, we will look back at this and say, this was our generation's moment. This was our chance to build the infrastructure that people needed to connect and to thrive in the modern economy. And so I think that is what we're hoping for uh, in a decade. That was really well put. Um, I, I would agree closing the digital divide, but kind of looking at it from the lens of e-commerce and from the technology sector, um, I think we all know that technology has been such a major force for good, but I think you could argue that the benefits have not been realized equitably in all parts of the country. Uh, and maybe it you know, has outsized impact in Silicon Valley and on the coast. And similarly, e-commerce, I think, was supposed to be the great equalizer, this big opportunity, uh, but it perhaps hasn't been felt equitably either. So I think if we're able to make real inroads in closing the digital divide, we'll have an e-commerce marketplace that's more vibrant, uh, where there's opportunity for many players, not just the few, and where all of us can benefit equitably from gains in technology. Yeah, and, and I would build on Caroline's point about the inequality. I mean, and it's based on the research that we're doing right now in terms of the impact that broadband can have in access to health information and reducing things like diabetes, or obesity, some of the afflictions and the cost that it requires for our, our country as a whole. So these things move slowly. So five years, we, we might not, but I would like to start seeing some of these effects. I would like to see some of the reduction in inequality and access to education and, and, and increasing on some of these healthcare metrics. Because that, that's the proof in the pudding that we did it right. All right, we have another question that I'll actually, I'll tee it up while you all have a chance to think, which is really what we celebrate at Network On is the personal impact. It's the stories of the small entrepreneur that was able to now have a global business. It's the story of someone who's able to access mental health care services that they really needed for the first time. So I want each of you, while I talk for a second, to think about one of those personal stories that has really impacted you, that you've come across through either in your personal or professional life. So I will take a minute to talk about myself. Um, I am from Orrington, Maine, which is a very small town about eight miles outside of Bangor, Maine. It is best known as Derry in all of Stephen King's books. So that's, that's the most you would know about Orrington. Um, I grew up without real access to the internet. Um, I have a brother who is 20 years younger, and we just got broadband access when he was a sophomore in high school. And it's made a big impact in the way he finished high school compared to my sister and I, who were still hanging out in libraries. He saw that transformation, the way they did things at school, grades, online, and I think the little thing that I'm most excited about is my stepfather no longer drives to our local Walmart 
to check his email after hours. And just those small things, I think, really matter. And that, those are the things we like to celebrate here at Network On. So who would like to share a story first? Okay, so, uh, but I, I think uh, before I share the specific story, um, I grew up in Louisiana, left 20 plus years ago, came back a couple of years ago. Um, and not to sound too Pollyannish, uh, I've been really amazed at the inventiveness of Louisianians, especially in the face of, uh, from, from a resilience perspective. And that's not just because of the pandemic, but we're in hurricane season. We have had our share of hurricanes in the last couple of years. We've got five. Uh, hurricanes affect a lot of parts of southern Louisiana. And as these hurricanes get stronger, there are still hurricanes as they go up Louisiana, Arkansas, and other states. And so I've been amazed at the, at the uniqueness and inventiveness in the entrepreneurial spirit that all Louisianians have throughout the state. Um, and I'm glad that we're, we're gonna focus and address some issues around climate um, and climate resilience as part of our five-year action plan that we're gonna be submitting to NTIA for, for, the, bead, for the bead money. Um, but specifically, uh, let me highlight a, a, a story of a, of a town uh, west of Baton Rouge, um, Gross Tet. It's a 25, 30 miles west of Baton Rouge two and a half, maybe thousand people. Uh, the mayor, uh, before the pandemic had issues around broadband, it only bubbled up with him because he had two investors who said, hey, we'd love to invest in your community, but we need better broadband. He's like, okay, this broadband thing I think is really important. And so he applied for a, a federal uh, program grant from uh, US Department of Ag, um, a reconnect grant, received it, and uh, his success as a community is, is going to be huge. Every, every resident, small business is going to have access to fiber optic speeds. That's one. But one thing that he's mentioned is that he said, Vinny, property values in my community have gone up. One. The second is um, multi-million dollar investments are being placed in a very large truck stop um, along I-10, which stretches from Jacksonville to Santa, uh, to Santa Barbara, California, Jackson, Florida. And it's partly because now these trucks have the ability to do credit card processing, right? Because of internet. And so, uh, you know, we like the many stories in Louisiana, but I like to highlight his because he has seen first uh, firsthand what the impacts are, both from a uh, livelihood perspective, but also from an economic development perspective. Yeah. I guess, um, I'll tell a story in a second about some folks I recently met. I, I just have to say, I would, uh, it's, it is striking how um, across the country we're hearing about how much need there is out there. And I'd say I first came into this space, um, you know, over 25 years ago. I was a teenager. Uh, now I um, uh, started working, you know, as a kind of young computer scientist and lawyer here in Washington working on the internet. And, um, you know, at the time it really felt like we were talking about the digital divide, but it felt like something that, you know, kind of felt hypothetical, you know, like internet was mostly for nerds. There were, you know, 40 million people online in the, you know, like 95, 96. And, you know, but at the same time, I think we always knew this day would come, right? That the day would come when the internet was, we hoped the day would come actually, when the internet became this essential medium, this thing that you needed uh, in order to be able to thrive uh, in the modern economy. And, and we've long passed that, right? Uh, uh, you folks here in this room, you, you know this, right? And COVID laid bare uh, for all of us how essential uh, the network is and uh, to be able to get an education, to be able to uh, do your job, access to health, access to justice. Uh, and we've been hearing that story now. I think folks at NTIA, you know, in this run up to the notices we put out in the last few months, we've been staff and traveling all over the country, 
uh, talking to folks about what they needed in these programs, uh, hearing uh, their reactions once we've put these notices out. I was in Cleveland just last week, and I visited the, uh, a place called the Ashbury uh, Community Center. It's uh, been around for almost 20 years, actually, uh, really focused on digital literacy, focused on senior citizen, se seniors, I should say. Um, and uh, I had a chance to sit and watch a class that they were doing with a group of seniors. And it, it was amazing to go around the room and hear how much it meant to those folks to have the opportunity not just to have access, but to, to know what to do when they were online, to have a device that they could use online, to have a sense of what applications you know, they could use and have a, know their way around, understand the opportunity that they had. And for some of them, it was the ability to you know, write a resume uh, uh, that they'd never been able to do before, help their grandchild with their homework, uh, schedule a medical appointment, you know, things that a lot of folks who are digital natives take for granted uh, but that the, for these folks, that opportunity, again, part of it was having the connection. The connection is the essential starting point, but it was also the device, the applications, the true literacy work that we need to do to get real meaningful adoption. And, you know, I think that story is repeated over and over again across America right now. And that's why this work is going to be so important in the years to come. That's really powerful. Um, I'll share one example of a Shopify merchant that I think really illustrates the power of the internet and tools like Shopify. Um, so there is a company called Nana Live, which before the pandemic, it was a woman named Chiara who lived in a rural town about an hour outside of Rome. Um, and their business was doing these live cooking classes for tourists with her grandma. So her grandma, Nana, would do the cooking classes. Yeah, Obviously, when the pandemic struck, this model could not continue. Italy was ground zero, and it's like an 85-year-old woman we're talking about. Um, so Chiara quickly pivoted and found Shopify and used the platform to sell live cooking classes uh, where people would live stream Nana's classes. Uh, that became so popular that they ended up employing a bunch of other nanas and it became a thing, like cooking with grandma. So there is something I like, have heard of this. Yes. 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 Yeah, so then there was a whole network of all these nanas bringing the magic of Italian cooking to people across the world. Um, and then that became so popular that they decided to distribute their olive oil in their town, which was like the lifeblood of their town. Um, so if you think about it, they partnered with a distributor, I think, in the U.S. that they found online to do that. Uh, it, you know, their business impacted, obviously, the nanas they employed, all of them, uh, the people in their small town who picked the olives, did the bottling, the supplier across the country. Um, and just the fact that not only was this family able to, you know, make a living, um, they were also able to bring their passion to people all over the world. People didn't have to visit Rome and go to this remote village to get the magic of their cooking and their culture. So I just thought that story was really cool about showing the power of Shopify and how the internet can connect people. That is a fantastic story. Dr. Katz, do you have one you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, um, well, I, you remember in my introduction, I said that before the internet, I had to edit documents and I had to go to the pharmacy because that was where the place where a fax machine was to send it to the office. So um, now the pandemic hits, uh, our, our daughter and our son move in with us. Uh, she comes from Brooklyn, he comes from Seattle. And suddenly uh, we have four users and obviously we need more broadband. And um, so I call, um, I think Optimum, and I say, I want a one gigabit per second line. Okay, it's ready, hook it up. So suddenly I, uh, I'm teaching on Zoom and uh, our son is programming on, he's doing a postdoc in artificial intelligence, uh, dealing with uh, self-driving cars. And he's doing his programming on remote computing with the University of Washington. My daughter is doing digital marketing and my uh, wife is doing project finance in Africa. And I, I was just, it blew my mind personally, how is that possible that we can do that? And to make things worse, last night I'm talking to my mother, she's 91, and she says, I actually disagree with an article that was published in the New York Times yesterday. She lives in Argentina. And I said, well, well, you read the Times? I get the Times remotely, and she's 91. <laughs> so, I mean, the distance from, I, I, I'm dating myself from when I grew up, 
And what it was at MIT, uh, programming and interacting with that ARPANET, and what we're living today, is just dramatic. It just blows my mind. Thank you. And we are going to see if you have any questions. So if you have a question for our panelists, please raise your hand and we will bring you a microphone. Anyone? Anne? Hi, Anne Keeney with Glen Echo Group. Um, question for the group. We've talked a lot about the tech that we've seen in the last two years, two and a half years during the pandemic. I'm curious if folks wanted to talk about a more future-looking perspective, particularly IoT, AR, VR, how we think that would affect local economies and our GDP at large. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll start by just saying, you know, we know there will be new technologies that uh, are gonna place new demands on our network. The, the, the story of the last 20 or 25 years, it's, it's just as Dr. Katz said, you know, the, in some ways that the unimaginable has become inevitable, right? Like that these uses that we never thought would be possible. Who's gonna need multiple video streams on their home, you know, internet connection? That's crazy. Well, now, you know, who doesn't need that? You know, how, you've gotta have that, right? And so I think we have take as a, uh, and should take as a, an article of faith that the innovation in this space is continuing, if anything, accelerating, whether it's gonna be uh, AR, VR, uh, whether it's gonna be uh, new high definition video, uh, or things that we haven't even thought of or imagined today. And I think we have, I will just say, uh, as people trying to implement these programs and think, we have tried to think about that resilience. In fact, Congress instructed us, required us to think about that resilience as we think about building the networks. And you'll see in our notices an idea, the idea that we've got to build resilient networks, re networks that are gonna meet the high speed demands of the future. Part of some of the choices that we've made to really uh, make sure that states are building out those highly resilient networks. Uh, and um, we don't, we will probably not get this shot very often. It is not very, it's once, it is truly once in a generation that we spend of billions of dollars on building out broadband. We cannot go back to Congress five years from now, 10 years from now and say, oh, we need more money to build higher speed networks because we didn't do it right this time, right? This is our shot. It's, it's, it's the, what we're doing at NTIA, what the states are doing, other federal agencies, this is our shot. And I think we've really got to keep looking to the future and understand that we're building networks that are gonna to have to meet that demand. Yeah, and just to piggyback, Secretary said, you know, again, this is a one-shot deal. We're gonna be as judicious with the money and make sure that it goes to the right places um, to impact the right communities, et cetera. But, uh, you know, as a, uh, to your question in, in terms of what does it look like in the future, if you start to think about the trends from Silicon Valley, precision ag and ag tech, for instance, is rapidly being invested in by both traditional and non-traditional investors. So if you think about what they're investing in and you com converge that with the investments that are gonna be made from a broadband perspective to solve those functional needs, then you're gonna start to see some really interesting, disruptive ways to do farming between now and the future, right? So if you start to combine, you know, for instance, what John Deere is doing or any of the other big manufacturers with sensors, especially with rapidly changing environments. Um, it, it helps the farmer uh, in a better way, for instance, pivot from what they're doing to what they can do given technology. In the same applications on the healthcare side, if you start to see the disruption in sort of this whole industrialization of, of healthcare, for instance, I mean, a lot of that's fed by venture capitalists investing in health tech services, tech enabled services, right? And so if you think about Louisiana, you know, with the use of broadband, suddenly these 64 parishes that may have had traditional issues around accessing healthcare, now can access healthcare, even if they struggle to recruit specialists, right? That specialist could be in another state, I mean, or it could be in another part of Louisiana. So 
that's what we're now looking at in terms of defining those use cases. Of course, we're going to solve the unserved, underserved community anchor institution, but I think if we're smart with, with the financial resources that we have, I think we can really make Louisiana a sandbox for innovation as it relates to partnerships with industry, nonprofits, um, academia to help drive what Louisiana's future could look like with a lot of this investment that's going to occur. And I think we had one more question in the audience. One second. Uh, hi, I'm Nick Digani from the Digital Progress Institute. Uh, my, my question is uh, primarily for the director and for the assistant secretary. Um, what keeps you up at night right now? You have $40 billion in your lap. You're trying to get this all done. Is it uh, lack of participation? Is it uh, execution? Is it getting the maps right? Is it making sure that it's actually affordable, not, not just built? Is it getting people to sign up? Is it coming back, having to come back to Congress saying, we spent a lot of money, it was really great, but we still need more? What keeps you up at night? Well, I mean, there's always execution risk, especially execution risk with things that we can't control. Right? So it could be, God forbid, you know, something else. I mean, in January 2020, didn't necessarily anticipate having a uh, pandemic, right? So I think a lot of it is are things that are not in control, which means from our perspective, which means from our perspective, thank you. Um, uh, Thank you, <laughs> the assist, right? Um, but from our perspective, it's um, how do we, again, try to anticipate what those challenges are gonna be? And in our case in Louisiana, how quickly can we iterate both legislatively and non-legislatively in partnership with the ISPs, et cetera, to keep moving, right? And so, you know, I would say in Louisiana, we have, I will say this, the best broadband team um, because now 49 other states and other territories may say differently, but we have constantly focused on iterating based on feedback that we get from folks on the ground, folks we get from feds and not wait. So we'll take that Silicon Valley approach, try something, learn, pivot, try, learn, pivot until we get it right. And so, um, you know, that's, that's the focus that we have as a, as a culture within our organization in Louisiana. Well, I would say you know all of the above. Uh, now, th there's a lot. There's a lot that we. It's 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 uh, it. We're we're executing on a huge program. It's, it's a lot of money. Uh, it's also honestly, is there, it's a complex program the way that Congress has constructed it. So there's a lot of execution risk that we're tracking. Uh, we look at the states. The states uh, are a huge piece of this for us. Um, so much of the money that we're going to be administering goes first to the states to grant. So, uh, you know, we're going to be look, watch, watching the need, uh, uh, but, but honestly, Louisiana is not, you know, not our issue, really. Uh, I think that, that we know that there's a wide variety of states in terms of their level of preparation out there. So I think we're, we're working to, to, to make sure that we can be a, you know, can help the states, uh, but the states that need it uh, uh, the most. Think about working with local communities uh, who themselves need to be part of this, to engage with this, know best where the, the need is out there. There's a whole set of risk around uh, you know, some of these uh, issues that are a little bit out of our control, the supply chain risks that we're tracking. Um, we watched workforce, which I think is going to be a huge need. Again, huge opportunity, but huge need. And you know, the only other thing is I'd say I, I think about the fact that there's going to be failure in this, and that's not something we love to talk about in Washington. But if we do, you know, this is ultimately going to be, you know, 56 different eligible entities managing, you know, uh, both digital equity programs and the state grant programs, middle mile programs that we're doing, tribal grant programs. There's going to be hundreds and hundreds of different grants that get made to different providers. We want them to be lots of different kinds of providers. We want new entrants in the field. We want different models of experimentation. And in somewhere in there, something's not gonna work. Somebody's gonna fail. And um, if there were zero failures in all of those hundreds, probably thousands of grants that were given, then uh, we probably hadn't taken enough risk. We haven't been creative enough. 
And so the question of, you know, how we make sure that we're resilient against the failures that are going to happen, uh, against these challenges that are out there, uh, that's, that's the kind of thing that we like to think about. And, you know, what we're doing is trying to make sure we're mitigating those risks and working against them. First and foremost, by building out teams that uh, within NTIA, for, for example, to work with the states and local communities to try and make sure they're addressing these risks and being clear eyed about where they are. So there's lots of execution to do out there, uh, but you know this is this is what we're here for, and it couldn't be a more exciting time to be doing it. Any other audience questions? If not, I have one to close us out with. Now this is not to date all of us on this panel, but what was your first internet connection? I am AOL CD era old. <laughs> Caroline, I'm gonna ask you first so I can return your mic. Yeah, I definitely dial up. So I have all of the memories of like being yelled at to get off the phone so my parents could check their email or so my brother could play Neopets or go on AOL Instant Messenger or whatever. <laughs> Uh, there was this thing at MIT called Project Athena. Uh, Dr. Katsumi, uh, that was uh, really my, as an undergraduate, my first taste of what this network of networks could look like. And um, you know, it's amazing to see over time how far we've come. And uh, I think what's incredible, as I was saying before, is you know, uh, um, even then you could feel. I just remember the first time I kind of got online, as it were. At, in that kind of strange world that it was back then, uh, you could immediately understand the power of it and the opportunity to connect with anybody around the world, the opportunity to be a speaker to anybody around the world who was on the network. Uh, and like I said, we knew this moment was gonna come where it was gonna become an essential part of our lives. And now that we're here, you know, this is, that's why this work is so important to show uh, why it's so critical for us all to be connected. It took a lot of politicking when I was in high school to um, convince my parents to invest in a game console. In that case, it was Sega Genesis, right? Competitor to Nintendo. It then took a couple of years. Once I got to college, where I actually sent my first email in August of 97, 25 years ago. So um, I'm still, you know, my wife will say I am pretty... Um, I lack in the digital literacy, so I need to improve that. Um, but yes, that will be an evolving process as we move on. So that's that was my first true internet experience was in August of 97. No, I, I left before Project Athena, so <laughs> <laughs> my first connection was on ARPA. <laughs> and, uh, old school. Old school. And, and the etiquette was very interesting because you would, you would never use caps on ARPANET and you would never say dear someone. You would just write whatever you wanted to say. And I guess professors were at the time very uh, unconventional. I don't know. But uh, that was the first time. But I remember the first time I saw an Apple IIe when they brought it at, uh, in the department. And that was in 1985 or something like that. See, we went through the whole history of the internet <laughs> right here. This was fantastic. Well, a big thank you to all of you who are here in person, the folks that have joined us online, and again to Network On's partners, the Consumer Technology Association, Comcast, Zoom, Patreon, and the Mike Coalition. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we will see you again very soon. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.